Good afternoon, everybody. Here we are again. Uh, I'm Ron. I'm here with uh, my sidekick, Artur. And we have another great special guest with us today, John Veli. Um, I'll let John, I'll let you do an intro in a second, but uh, maybe a good way to do the intro is, Artur, why don't you uh, ask him something? Yeah, yeah. It's really exciting to be here, especially today with John. And uh, so, John, first thing I uh, would like to ask you, how did you become uh, an immigration attorney? Oh, that's great, Arthur. Um, yeah, so uh, it wasn't anything that I focused on in law school at all. Um, I was a rugby player and was playing rugby on an international tour in New Zealand. And uh, it was an interesting time. It was 1994, and the sport of rugby was the last major sport internationally to go to go professional there was a big fight about it the new zealanders wanted to because most new zealanders were um you know bricklayers and and laborers right but the english uh who invented the sport and really kind of controlled it um if you were a really good rugby player the top clubs in england would get you a great job in a bank or something like that right so um and they get to continue in those jobs after their rugby career so they were really hesitant to it so what happened is as south africa was coming out of apartheid. And you may remember the movie Invictus uh, with Matt Damon, right? Um, they, uh, nobody would play them during the apartheid era, so they professionalized their sport. So the New Zealanders went to South Africa, so all of them were, were uh, professionals, and they said, we need to do it. Now, the Olympics was already pro by this time. Um, so what we did is the first green card for a professional rugby player, and we did that in 1994. And since that time, we got into numerous other sports. So, and then from other sports into entertainment, from entertainment into techies. And matter of fact, we were in the tech sector when, when we launched this entire endeavor, which we call online visas. So it sort of evolved naturally. And uh, I guess that's it in a nutshell. That's my, that's my moment uh, was it dawning on us in New Zealand with one New Zealand player on our team that we can get you a green card let's try this thing out. And from that, I've got, you know, three guys in the first round and of the last NFL in the NBA draft. I'm sorry. We've had, um, uh, a, what do you call it? A most valuable player in the world series and Pablo Sandoval. We've got NFL guys. Um, you know, we've probably been in 50 different sports, um, in that. And then obviously tech and, and medicine and all these other things, but that's, that was the genesis of it all. That's cool. That's cool. Thanks. And, uh, how, how did you end up running your own business after all this was back? Yeah. So look, it's, it's funny. Cause I, I did it in a way that you wouldn't do it on purpose, right? You can't plan it like this. Um, but I was, uh, I left some of the bigger cities, right? I had, uh, I graduated the University of Cal Berkeley, right in the Bay area. I went to Denver, I actually worked in a big law firm there just doing filing. Um, didn't think I'd ever become a lawyer. And then, um, I applied to law school, both in Colorado and back in my home state of Oklahoma, and I got in at OU and uh, Oklahoma University, and I started working for a lawyer, and he started suffering these migraines, uh, really bad ones, and he essentially couldn't practice the spring semester of my last year in law school. I just absorbed his, uh, his client base, right, and uh, I was going to court as an intern. One of the judges took me aside and said, you shouldn't be doing this, but it was working out. And so I, I just started practicing law. I just hung my own shingle and, and went from there. And it took that a couple of things to evolve into um, immigration. Uh, but one of the things is I started in tech and I had a friend who was bouncing. This was at the, uh, you know, the first real tech boom um, in the in the 90s. And uh, this guy, uh, a friend of mine, launched a tech company, asked if I could incorporate him. And we did. And uh, I became on his board and we we went through a couple of years, which was fantastic. We went from three employees to 400. We acquired 11 different companies. We raised $91 million. And I can remember one of the great days was we had a, uh, a luxury box in the Dallas Cowboys stadium, the old one. And at halftime, Roger Staubach and Kirk Schilling, you might remember Kirk Schilling was the pitcher for the Phillies with the bloody, bloody uh, sock and pitched for the Boston Red Sox in the World Series. And uh, Merle Haggard. And Merle Haggard was a country western singer. And those three guys came into our luxury box that we had. And I've only been out of law school for about two years at this point. And they all wrote us million dollar checks. That was a pretty good day, right? So uh, working for that tech company is when 
we decided because I was, I was living in Oklahoma and I, and this company was in Dallas and I had to go down there for three or four days a week. And I still wanted to keep my practice open. So my little brother had just graduated. We, we started a firm together and he was holding down the fort in Oklahoma while I was going to, uh, to Texas. And so we launched a, a new type of practice and we found uh, at this point, like this is 1994 or five, there were no website names left. All the good ones were taken by that point, right? I mean, people were thinking of making their phone number.com, right? So, uh, but lo and behold, we found onlinevisas.com and we registered that name. I wanted visas online, but it, that wasn't available. But onlinevisas.com was there. And then so we really kind of built our whole practice around the name, right? And so it was really interesting at that point in the 90s uh, how people hired attorneys. No one would hire an attorney online, not then. And, and it's amazing how many people will today. And we, we still have a regular practice, don't, don't get me wrong, but we have about 1,200 to 2,000 people a day come to our site pre-corona. And um, so it was really interesting to launch that website and we started picking up some really fantastic clients like uh, Bell Laboratories, where Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone and where they have more patents than anybody, right? I mean, these guys were rock stars and they're in New Jersey and they would have to take the day off work to go meet with their immigration attorneys in New York and sit in there and they'd have to pay these upfront consultation fees. And we would do, talk to us for free. We'll just do the visa. And they loved us. And it was really fantastic. So we, you know, we started building this practice and we, we won an ABA award and people said we had changed the way um, you practice law. We, we got, uh, we were called innovators in the legal industry back in the nineties by the ABA. And, and it was really neat. So we've always been, looking at change, right? And so, you know, that's kind of how we got into it. That's where the tech comes from. And so we've been really lucky to work with some fantastically talented people. We really cut our teeth on extraordinary ability immigration, right? And then kind of uh, filtered down into the simpler ones over the years. Oh, that's amazing. And Ron, I'm, I'm curious to, to know your, your, your story about that as well. How you became an immigration attorney and how you, you ended up running your business. Cause I think it's, it's a slightly different story. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know how to follow that story up, uh, or those stories. Um, I'm certainly not Matt Damon or Ben Affleck, uh, let alone a rugby player. <laughs> um, you know, you know, what's funny is as I was listening, John, as I was listening to your story and how, um, you know, you ended up doing this green card for, for rugby player almost on a whim, it seems like. Mm -hmm. um, th there's, when I think about why I became an immigration lawyer, there's a number of different influences, but one of them was that um, when I was third year of studying engineering at University of Illinois, um, and by the way, I forgot to do this in the intro, but John, uh, you're in Norman, Oklahoma. Oklahoma? Yeah, Norman, Oklahoma, yeah. So, home of the Sooners. Uh, That's right. Artur and I are both uh, UCLA guys, although I grew up in Illinois, so you have yeah. I as well. Uh, but um, <clears throat> third year of studying engineering, I got an opportunity to work for a chemical factory in France as an intern. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I should really be sharing all this story publicly, but <laughs> the long story short is that I discovered the hard way, let's just say, that uh, there's that other countries also have rules about work permits. <laughs> and um, that, that led to me through a series of twists and turns. I had to actually uh, go to uh, the, the, the final step of the process happened about halfway through my stay. I had to go to the French consulate in Dusseldorf, Germany, uh, as opposed to going all the way back to the US, to right. the French consulate in the US. And I remember by that point, my French was actually good enough that I remember showing up at the gate at the French consulate and asking them um, or, or telling them that I was there to apply for the, the I think it was called the carte de séjour. Um, and they, they, they couldn't, they didn't know what to make of me because my French was good enough at that point, but they knew that I wasn't a native French speaker and they were like, no, you know, where, and, and they, they were like, no, 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 you need to go to the American consulate. I'm like, no, I am American. I don't need, <laughs> so, um, but I eventually got the paperwork that I was supposed to have. And um, I think that was definitely one thing that made me appreciate the fact that 
what what our clients go through it it's it's paperwork but it's their life you know like right. there was this there was this period where i didn't know what was going to happen and the company was trying to help me but uh even back then when it wasn't really super controversial um there's still bureaucracy involved and and it's kind of cumbersome for sure um well, i'm glad you brought that up it um you know people ask you know ask you all the time well, what do you do? And you say you're an immigration attorney, right? And, and I don't know that anybody understands what that means, right? Um, you know, I mean, are you helping people sneak over the border, terrorists, all these, uh, all these rapists, right? I mean, there, there's a real negativity, especially in the middle of America. And, um, and I don't know they know where we fit in the whole puzzle. And, and there's a lot of different types of immigration attorneys. There are people that deal with uh, a lot of the deportations. I don't do any of that. I'm, I'm all business immigration. But I had a friend who was a doctor and he was a GP, right? General practitioner. And he, he, his name was Brian. I'd say, hey, Brian, how you doing? He'd always say, oh, just saving lives, which I would laugh, right? Because, you know, he was dealing with colds and, uh, you know, and things like that. I don't know that Brian ever saved a life, although he probably could. But in any case, um, you know, I thought about what, how do we define what we do? And, and so what we say we do at, at our law firm, uh, Beely Law Firm, is we deliver dreams, right? And we could say that we fill out, um, you know, forms for disinterested government employees, which we do, right? Uh, but I think if you look at that's what you're doing, you miss the point, right? I mean, I think that's what disinterested government employees look at what they're doing. I'm looking at a bunch of forms, right? So we call it delivering dreams because you really have to understand that what we're being asked of is massive. And what I noticed in, in the 26 years I've been practicing, and it doesn't get old, is the funnest thing you can do is call up a client and tell them they got their visa, especially if it's a green card. I mean, they, they thank you profusely. They, they give you way too much credit for this. It, it's not that it's easy. It's not easy. But, um, you know, I have a lot of clients who have said, you know, you're the reason I'm in America. You know, I wouldn't ever be where I'm at without you, which isn't true. It's just not even true at all. But, but what they're getting by moving from another country to a country, or even, you know, the feeling is even if you're coming from Canada, the United States, or where I went from Oklahoma to California, I mean, that was a massive, you know, upheaval, right? And, and to, to find uh, a way to stay is, is a big deal. And because it's so hard, um, they really do that. On the converse of it, it's almost like you're dashing a dream if a case gets denied. Right. And so if you've got a team of people, um, you really got to find words to help everybody in your organization understand how important what you're doing is and to really get that. And if you and if your team understands they're delivering dreams with you um, and they understand how important that relationship is, I tell you, I always let my team make the first phone call. Whoever our case manager is always calls them up and uh and tells them because that's the best thing right and uh and i really appreciate that i think more than i ever knew that i would right it, it, you don't know that until you get into this job of just how special our country is um you you know i was kind of an anti-authoritarian growing up kind of a kind of a punker and uh or at least a smart ass but um i never thought of myself as as somebody who wrapped themselves in a flag by any means but we get to hear every day about, you know, why people want to come here, why they want to come to America, what they, what they want to get out of it. And understanding that it's a dream is a realization that I think most anybody that does this probably gets. But if you really put a word to it, um, it really makes it special and fun and exciting and really one of the best bodies of law to ever get into because we're not going through divorces with people. We're not having people who've been sued or are going to sue somebody um, or all the other miserable reasons that you have to hire a lawyer, right? Well, they just want their dream delivered. And if you do it, it's, uh, it's fantastic. It, it, it's so funny that you put it that way because I think the, the, the dream delivered and the disinterested government employee. Um, <laughs> they coexist. It, well, and especially lately I'm finding that when we're working on a difficult, uh, what's called a request for evidence, so people don't sure. do information where the government wants to know more information before they'll, they'll decide the case. Um, and we work a lot with extraordinary individuals as well. Um, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of uh, business people that are particularly starting up sure. companies, entrepreneurs. Yep. And these guys are all doing fantastic, guys and gals, they're all doing fantastic things. And, Oftentimes when I see that request for evidence from the government, 
when I start writing things down, often it's, it's Artur and my other associate that have to be like, Ron, like you've got to tone that down because right. what I want to say to the adjudicator is you've got to do this for America. Like we need this person here. And why don't you understand that? And there's like this, to me, I mean, I feel really patriotic what I'm doing. It's like, yeah. I'm helping bring the best people on the planet to our country. And, and, Anybody who sees it differently, I mean, you're right. Like immigration that's in the news, it has such a negative spin to it. But to me, it's like we're trying to actually make our country the best it can be. You're absolutely right. And, and I think they've sanitized their role in this, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I say this to my clients all the time, especially when it's hard, is these folks think they're detectives, right? They're detectives that have wrapped themselves in the flag and they're investigating the crime of illegal immigration and illegal meaning it doesn't meet my standards, right? Not okay. that they snuck over the border. And you've, you were finding they've become very creative and really more articulate in their reasons for denials lately. I mean, it's really been rough. And um, you know, I've, 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 I've sued, I was a litigator simultaneously to doing this in, in immigration, but I never did immigration from the litig litigation side before. I've sued the U.S. government a number of times uh, with the, I represented Native Americans and, and did some cases, I three up to the Supreme Court on uh, Native American rights, uh, membership rights. And I, I sued the uh, um, TSA um, on a EEOC complaint, right? So I've sued the government a number of times, but I only recently sued them in immigration. And I think it's going to have to be part of a lot of immigration attorneys practice right now. And it's one of the interesting things as I was just reading a case the other day where they overturned the, uh, the decision of immigration on the fact that they didn't analyze an expert, an expert's opinion, mm -hmm. right? Like they didn't look at all of the evidence in front of them, which is notoriously what they do, right? Yeah. So if you read these RFEs or the denials, you'll see that they'll pick something I call it the, the, uh, the string in the sweater, right? They'll take the little string in the sweater and undo the whole sweater with one thing. And they'll just be very conclusionary, which we tell our team, don't ever be conclusionary. Make sure that it's supported by evidence. But they'll find something and we'll think this isn't good enough because of whatever in some yeah. generic conclusionary term. And then they'll completely omit massive amounts of evidence. Like, yeah. like you didn't put it in there at all. And I was really happy to see as I'm becoming more litigious on this, that a case was overturned by just not looking at one piece of evidence. It's pretty interesting. So, so, so we're, and, and sorry, Artur, we're, John and I are both getting so excited about this, but um, we just got into uh, uh, doing federal litigation of employment-based immigration uh, oh, cool. starting last year as well. So okay. we're probably similar stage as you. And um, I, I can't even tell you the feeling of euphoria that I felt the first case we filed there were, yeah. we also included a temporary restraining order because yep. the, the, the beneficiary was going to have to leave the country. So there was a exig okay. exigency to the case. Right. And we literally got the government to reopen it and approve it within three days of filing the case. That's and exactly what happened to us on our last case. Ron. I, that's, that's a great point, John. Um, you and I are both getting really excited about uh, litigating, um, you know, I try to I try to tell all my clients, other lawyers I meet, that this is really a tool, a mandatory tool that you have to offer your clients. Right. Not and also even further than that, lawyers have to start um, basically helping their clients understand that it's not a shameful or a wrong thing to do to sue the federal government. I mean, I know plenty of companies that have no hesitancy to sue the IRS to get a better tax refund. Right. But yet for some reason, there's this remarkable reluctance to challenge the government over what is clearly a, a wrongful decision. So right. uh, I'm glad to hear that you're having success and that you're building that practice area. Well, we just did exactly what you did. Um, we filed a temporary restraining order. We had an athlete who was in mid season and they um, revoked his visa. He was the top try, top point scorer for his team and number five in the league in all league, right? And they had a game on Saturday and they revoked him on Thursday. So we put together a temporary restraining order. Um, my client was also a lawyer. Um, and so his firm and I put together all the documents we needed 
Um, we worked an <laughs> amazing amount of hours in no time at all. And he ran down and on a, on a Friday afternoon at about 10 till five, five in New Orleans, he found one judge and the judge granted the temporary restraining order. The next week, immigration conceded without even answering the complaint and just unrevoked him, yeah. <laughs> gave him his visa back. But then they hit another RFE on the same issue and then denied somebody on the same issue. So I think they're disingenuous sometimes uh, that they, if they just give the person that actually files this suit the visa, they can continue on with their, um, their approach. And, and I've had some really good conversations with a lawyer named John Wasden. And he represented IT serve in a case called IT serve versus CISNA, which is the big H1B case. And yeah. John is the litigator for USCIS before he, you know, left the dark side, and came over <laughs> to our team. And so he knows where, you know, the, the underbelly is and he knows what they're afraid of and he knows where they're weak. So he's filing cases all over the place, right? Yeah. He's, he's an excellent font of information too. If you'd like to talk to him or anybody else that watches this, um, you know, that, that guy really knows his stuff and uh, he was helpful to me in our case. That's for sure. Yeah, I've, 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 I've definitely, I've met him. I've spoken with him. Uh, he, 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 uh, I'll say it was probably a little bit over a year ago that he, he started putting some posts out on LinkedIn that were, he did. Yep. they were inspirational to me in terms of getting over my own hesitation or Absolutely. nervousness. Um, I saw that decision. It's, I mean, obviously to me, it makes a lot of sense from just a lawyer point of view. Right. Um, I was just reading another comment today though, to that uh, there, there's another case called, I think it's called three Q. 3Q Media or 3Q Digital or something, which uh, the, the, it's another H1B case where, um, wow, I didn't expect us to get this sort of into the- No, to, it's great, but, man. It's but but, but um, the, the specifically about whether the a bachelor's degree is normally required yeah. and does it have to be in a specialty? And in that particular case, the, the immigration service tried to argue that it has to be in a subspecialty. That's saying- a degree in engineering was not enough that it needed to be a degree in one particular type of engineering and the court i mean what's what's fascinating to me is that case after case the government is losing every single case that goes to decision just read this yesterday it's the same <laughs> thing this one's called um, in what's it called inspection expert yeah. uh, corporation versus cuccinelli and they slammed them on it. I mean, it's, uh, let's, let's share uh, sites with each other. I'm, I want to create a database of all these cases. Uh, Next Generation's a good one on that too. The thing is that I'm seeing that is so frustrating though, is um, that they keep getting beat in court and they keep getting beat in court and they keep being, getting beat in court and then they just ignore it when yeah. they're adjudicating the cases because they don't think people will actually sue them after that because what client wants to spend uh, money on an attorney for a federal lawsuit when they just want a visa, right? I think, I think, um, <laughs> sorry, Artur, John and I are just going out of here, but um, <laughs> <We're at spring. laughs> uh, by the way, by the way, on that case that we filed, it was, it was one of the first cases that Artur worked on at, at, at my firm. And so right. the, sure. you know, he, he won his first case in federal court. And I remember saying, I remember saying to him and the other associate, I was like, you need to call up your classmates that went to the big law firms <laughs> and say, how many of you have won your first federal litigation lawsuit? Yeah, good thing. Did you use the Equal Access to Justice Act to get, get any money for that? Uh, in that case, because it never went to even summary judgment, they just reopened and approved the case. Um, it didn't get that far. I was curious if you could do that or not, because we just won ours recently, and I was just talking to somebody about that, right? I mean, we had to, we racked up some some fees and costs to our client, right? And I think it's worthy of taking a look at, and you may be right, but yeah. the EAJA, um, I think they have to show why they, you shouldn't have to be paid for it. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm grasping at this, I haven't done it, uh, but it might be worthy of something, but maybe if they concede it early, then they don't have to pay, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, yeah, I, I don't know, but, but I'm thinking about your earlier point. I saw a comment from another immigration lawyer just within the past couple of days about um, a similar case. It was for an industrial engineer where the government, uh, they had even cited to those recent cases, the inspection, inspection expert, 3Q, three, yeah. three whatever it is. Um, right. And the denial actually acknowledges that they had cited to those cases, but said that they're not persuasive authority. And then, I mean, 
that might be technically true that a district court case is not federal immigration law. Right. Um, but there's something going on that makes me, it, it, I have to believe that at some point there's, and this is my big conspiracy theory, is that <laughs> there's somebody within the agency that has some secret instructions that's really pushing these adjudicators to be aggressive and deny these cases. And, well, and I don't and, think it's a secret, man. I mean, well, but I mean, I think eventually there's going to be some memo, the smoking gun memo that comes out yeah. and maybe, maybe it'll take the government losing a class action suit with EJA fee, fees for tens of millions of dollars or some, something like that. And I think so that's where, I think that's where those guys are going. I think Wozden and those guys are, because they have IT serve, IT serve, I, I worked with them. I was, matter of fact, I was part of their uh, PAC committee, political, political action committee, when we were selecting Jonathan, right? We looked at a lot of attorneys. We looked at Fragman, Kurzban, um, a lot of the, you know, big kind of known immigration attorneys. And Jonathan made a lot of sense. Um, and, and obviously it was the right call. But they, uh, you know, this has been going on for a while. And what one way to look back and trace this is really interesting, because it's not quite jurisprudence, but it's just what, what's happening, right? Is that um, uh, Chuck Grassley, the senator from Iowa, you may remember him from the Kavanaugh, uh, you know, uh, hearings. Well, Grassley, since 2010, has had, has put forth a bill to drastically, drastically change the H and L visas. And he's also become the big kind of enemy on the EB-5. So Grassley's become the congressional leader against uh, business immigration, okay? So what the Trump administration did was really interesting. So we have Stephen Miller, and he's the sort of architect of anti-immigration strategy, right? But the real architect of how this agency is doing what this agency does is that Trump started hiring the former chiefs of staff of Grassley's committee and Grassley to become the policy people in USCIS, right? Those were the people that started writing these new policy things. So I don't think it's a secret. I think it was quite designed. And I think they went there and they said, who's the guy that doesn't like immigration the most? And what has he done on this? And how can they implement these plans? And they've just rolled them out memo after memo. And the courts have been upholding our side because they don't do it in a lawful way. Almost all these cases you read, they talk about, look, this, is, this should be a regulation. It shouldn't be a policy memo. This should be a law. Congress has already said, here's what we think the definition of a specialty occupation is. We don't need you telling us it's something more restrictive, right? Yeah, so, so um, I, maybe, maybe just a side, side detour for a second. Okay. Uh, just curious, Artur. So you're you're from Brazil, right? Right. You've you've now been you've you've been working in the area of U.S. immigration for about a year, let's say. Um, what's how, what's your impression of this? I mean, coming coming from outside the U.S., is this what you expected of the U.S. justice system, or even U.S. administrative, <laughs> whatever whatever you call it? Right. Um, well, that's <laughs> that's a good question. Um, Actually, no. I mean, what I'm what I'm experiencing right now, uh, I have the feeling it's it's more restrictive than I thought it would be. So I guess there's more of this enforcement mentality mm -hmm. that I wasn't aware about. So uh, it's 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 pretty much it's pretty different from what I expected to be honest. Especially with business immigration, because on this humanitarian uh, or, or, or or different sides of immigration, where um, it's more in a public debate. It's pretty much where I thought, but within business, business immigration, uh, I have the feeling it's, 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 it's way more restrictive than I, than I, that I imagine. So it's, so it's, it's, that's why it's pretty, also, it's a pretty interesting area to, to be working with. Good way to look at it. Yeah. I mean, uh, John, I wonder if, if some, some law students, uh, cause, cause a lot of our chats that we do are sort of more geared toward, sort of what are you thinking about as you're finishing law school or yeah, you know, yeah. or career exactly. career advice oriented but i'm wondering like if if i'm if i'm in law school right now 
I think that, I think that, you know, I don't know if you use this term, but I think that business immigration is a much sexier area of law than we get credit for. I mean, it, it seems very mundane filling out these forms and yeah. writing the support Agency letters. law, right? Yeah, but, but in reality, I mean, again, like I'm going to come back to my own sort of version of American patriotism. We're, you know, we're helping make sure the best and brightest are able to, to come here and contribute sure. to the growth of the country. And wow. that's, that's truly the way that I see it. So um, it, it is strange to me. It is something that growing up in a small college town in Southern Illinois, I just never imagined that to, to me, what often feels like the government being against small business. And it just, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, you're right. And if you look at it, this is, you know, there's, it's such a political football, right? That, you know, in, and unfortunately, there are people on both sides of the two kind of choices, Republicans and Democrats, that are both for immigration and against immigration. And that's why you don't see a lot of um, good reform, right? So you might see that um, one group will say, well, we don't want immigration reform if it's going to allow more visas for businesses, if it also doesn't do something about something that's the Hispanic community wants. Or you may see that the labor unions say, we don't want to see any increase in the number of visas because that's going to drive down the salaries of American workers, even if every statistical analysis does not show that, right? Yeah. Even if it means that for every H-1B worker, you're going to get a minimum of 1.8 Americans and up to seven in smaller companies, right? I mean, they're, all the stats show the more immigration comes in, the more our business will grow, right? If you just took off all the caps and the deadlines, our economy would increase, I saw a statistic of $100 million, I'm sorry, $100 billion over a 10-year period, right? But there, is, there are some things that are forged into our thinking right now that, that, are, that make people look against this, and it's quite bizarre if you think about it, because with the baby boomers aging out, right? The need for people to replace them in the workforce is massive. And we're losing more every year. And after COVID, it's going to even be worse, right? So it's a fantastic time to go into immigration. The question is, you know, will our, when will our administration realize that we are benefiting our economy? The, the irony, if you think about it, is we are number one in the tech sector in the world, right? Yet we have to import our talent, because we don't have enough people graduating with STEM degrees who are American citizens. You did it. I didn't, right? I, I, I don't know anything about tech other than how to turn it on, and I'm not always good at that. But, you know, the fact is, is that most kids in America don't do tech jobs, right? We need the Indians, right? We need the, the, the Iranians. We need the Chinese and all the others, the Russians that are coming in that have more of a propensity to that than we do to come in and help us to keep us at the top. But yet, we're knocking them down. And what I found really interesting is why aren't the big companies complaining about this? Well, all you got to do is take one uh, trip to Hyderabad, India, and seeing all the cranes up of all the American companies that are setting up in India, and that the real leaving of jobs in America are the tech jobs going to India, and that is losing the middle management jobs for Americans. It's crazy. So, so um, we're going to have to break this up into like eight parts, but, um, <laughs> right. but, but Great conversation. You, you've hit on something that actually I wish I could find a study on and maybe you know of it, which yeah. is um, as uh, particularly H1B visas, which are, it's right. the bread and butter of the tech companies because sure. you're right. They can't, I mean, whatever the statistics are, there's something like 4 million unfilled tech positions because they just can't find the people. Negative and by the way, right. By the way, even on the wage question, I can't tell you the number of times that I've been working on an H-1B for somebody where we have to pay the H-1B worker more than every other American working in the same position because the data that the Department of Labor has come up with, I don't yeah. know where it comes from, but oftentimes a company actually has to pay the foreign worker more than the American, which just, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive that that well, happens. Isn't it ironic, Ron, that we can't ri raise our minimum wage for Americans, but we mandate yeah. that the minimum wage for foreign workers is massively high? Yeah. <laughs> that, why is that lost in the debate? I, I don't know. But, but <laughs> what, what I'm wondering about it, and particularly because I spent 15 years in Canada, so I have all these connections to sure. uh, 
to companies in Canada, especially to immigration lawyers in Canada, where the, the attitude towards immigration is the polar opposite of the U.S. Right. I mean, they, are, they are seeing this as a global battle for talent and doing everything they can to attract the top engineers and scientists in the world to come to Canada and coming up with all kinds of mechanisms to streamline the process, et cetera, et cetera. Help out the spouses. That's something that we also do a terrible job at. Um, but yeah, but right. um, <clears throat> one of the things I've wondered as, as this time has gone on and I've seen sort of all the emphasis to attract H-1B lottery losers to Canada. Um, mm. And I've been to Hyderabad in India. Mm. Uh, and I, I'd love to see a study that somehow figures out how many companies have effectively just given up and just said, we can't fill these positions in the U.S. We used to use immigration, doesn't work anymore. We'll still try it for you know, a certain small percentage of our workforce, but we're just going to move all these jobs somewhere else where we can fill the positions. And not to mention the fact that I, I think it's going to be one of the most devastating impacts of the, the shelter in place, stay at home, all of that, is that any reluctance that a company had previously to having people work remotely, they've now realized that, yeah. oh my gosh, you know, all of our jobs can be done anywhere in the world. So right. why even try to get a visa for somebody? We'll just have yeah. the person work in Russia or, or wherever right. it would be. So oh, I, yeah, we're going to have a different economy when we get out on the other side of this. I mean, just think about it. Schools, you know, universities, when they start in the fall, will likely be all online. And so what happens to the university setting? You know, I mean, we've had online universities for a while, right? You know, University of Phoenix and others that are literally just that. And then you've seen the growth in all the major universities of having online presence, right? And, and I have a friend that runs OU Law School's uh, version of that. She has as many students and she has like two people in her staff um, and then she uses uh, all contracted professors and they come in for like a, a week and they, they shoot the entire semester and then they go away. Right. And then the students just log on. She has as many students in her program as the rest of the law school does. It's even right now. What happens if we don't go for a semester and what happens to the whole dynamic? And then just see this becomes a, a, uh, you know, a domino effect, right? Of, of what industry relies on this and relies on that. So it's, look, change is going to happen, right? And it will be good for some and bad for others. But I, I think the post Corona uh, economy is going to be an interesting one. Yeah, I actually, that I want to actually ask Artur about something about that. So this morning, um, <clears throat> one of the many groups that I've managed to get involved in, because I'm always looking for good talent out of law school, is um, I was on a breakfast this morning. It was actually lunch for the Penn State Law School Lawyer uh, Network, mm -hmm. and the deans there, and uh, somebody who had joined was an LLM who graduated a few years ago and is now in London. And I know, Artur, you, you did the LLM program at UCLA, and you're really well connected with a lot of the efforts that they make. And one of the things that Penn State Law said was that they've already pretty much got their LLM class for this coming year. Um, so it's less a question of whether they're going to still have a class, but they are having to figure out exactly as you said, how are they going to deliver? I think they use the term non-residence degree program. Mm -hmm. So even if they can never open the physical campus, those students are still going to get an LLM from that university. Yeah. And is that, have you been exposed to that at all through your, your connections at UCLA? Yeah, actually last week uh, we had a webinar about a lot like between alumni and also admitted students. And a bunch of them are kind of hesitant to accept the offer uh, because UCLA has declared that they're gonna do, they're gonna have presential classes, they're gonna have extra classes. However, as John was saying, it's 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 difficult to predict right now that yeah. this is this is something that's certain. So so I guess it's they're kind of counting to the fact that things are going to get back to normal. Mm -hmm. However, I think it's tough to predict. So I have a couple of friends who are um, they want to come to UCLA, they want to go to UCLA, they want to uh, do the LM this year, but uh, they're kind of reluctant because they're not sure if the situation is going to 
get back to normal because they don't want to they, they don't want to be at, like do an LLM which like half of the half of the of the, the beauty of doing an LLM is basically being in, in this different city and and, and yeah, live with other people so an online version it's not what they mm -hmm. expect so particularly for UCLA I think that's it and I think that it also applies for for different different universities mm. Yeah, I mean, we've, uh, I'll, I'll give, John, I'll give you the last word, but one of the things that I wanted to say earlier that, that our tourist comment reminded me of is that, um, you know, with, you could sometimes, it, it's sometimes really easy to look at the, the political climate, the, the negative attention on immigration, and hear even a lot of anti-American sentiment from people in certain countries and feel like, well, I guess nobody's gonna to wanna to come here anymore. But I, I, what I see day in and day out is that in spite of all of that, this is still the country that if you want to make it big, I'm gonna kind of make it in sort of economic terms, but mm -hmm. this is the country you come to. And, and like what Artur was saying, it's, I mean, the degree itself is worth something, but it's, it's, it's about those connections you make when you're physically here. So. I don't know. What, you get you get the last word. Well, I love you said that. I, I it is America is a unique place because it is really the only country in the world that is devoid of a um, an original people. Right? We're not an original anything. We are always a hodgepodge um, of of people from other places bringing that. We are an we are an environment right, is what America is. Um, Silicon Valley is lightning in a bottle. It's, you know, of course Canada would like to replace it, but it's hard to, right? It has some inherent things around it. One of the most inherent things about Silicon Valley that makes it the real place to want to start a company is the creativity and um, trust that money has, right? Not, and not just, you know, America, but that particular part of America, right? You do not see money being as creative in New York or Chicago or the rest of the country. It's, it's old loans, right? I mean, you know, put your house up and we'll do it. But the, uh, the investors there are so, are so creative and they understand how to identify talent. So one of the things I've always seen America has, um, even if it's people comprised from other places, is the ability to value ideas and value people. Right. And I, you know, so I've done a lot of work with China. I've done a lot of work with India, many different countries. Right. So I've, I had a friend in China that had a great idea for a startup. And she said, look, the investors didn't understand how to invest in me. They always wanted different things. They had a short time frame and they don't value what people bring. They're used to paying people a dollar a day you know, and do this simple thing, you know, make a rock, make a pill, make a, a nut, right? But the idea of valuing human ability into something that's hard to imagine is truly an American concept, especially in our Bay Area when it comes to technology, right? So it's hard to do this in India or Canada or England or anywhere else, right? I mean, and, that, and that's that, right? So that environment exists in that way. Um, and really, you said it there, it's like, I say this a lot of times, that anybody can make it in America. Not everybody does, but anybody can. And if you have enough work ethic or enough money or a good enough idea or just lucky and you're in the right place in the right time, it can work here, right? And, it, and it's, it's not that way everywhere else, right? I mean, it just isn't. You're going to butt up against something, whether it's a class structure, whether it's just who you are or whether they may have a design protection of their own. You know, Japan, if you're not Japanese, it's very difficult to make it in that country. They're not bad people. They're some of the nicest people you'll ever meet. But, you know, it's, you can't just pop down in Japan and say, I'm inventing this new, you know, whatever, and everybody just is cheering you, and you can make it like that overnight. And so I think that doesn't go away no matter who leads us. No matter what happens, that will still be here because that has been ingrained in our, I guess, cumulative or collective soul, right? And, you know, you, know, you may be Canadian originally and Arthur may be Brazilian originally, but once you come here and you become this, then you're us and we're all that. And, and I have an immigration story. It's three generations back, but we all do, right? Other than our Native American brothers. 
and sisters. But, you know, that's the thing about this place that hard to kill that. I, you know, if we do, then, uh, you know, then maybe the whole um, experiment, you know, fails, but I don't think we're anywhere close to that yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, thank you so much. This was, this was such a fascinating conversation. Uh, yeah, sure was wrong. The, the funny thing is there were a few things we had said we were going to talk about that we didn't, we didn't even get, get to those topics. <laughs> but we didn't get there. We'll have we'll to do, do this again, again next time. We'll, uh, we'll do more of this. This was a really great, uh, a great time. I really enjoyed it. Arthur, thank you so much for your, yeah, uh, likewise. Well, this was a, this was a blast. Let's, let's do mo more of it. And I, uh, you know, what we're going to do is I'm going to post this on our online visas, YouTube page. And we're going to ask uh, all those folks to like and share and subscribe to that. And, uh, and really appreciate what you're doing, Ron, on uh, LinkedIn, um, really using that methodology. And, and what's really cool about this, Arthur, probably, probably more for you than us, is, is this is the evolution of how to practice law, right? I mean, uh, when I started, uh, any lawyer that would give away information was you know somehow not doing it the right way and we had to to get clients from around the country to you know hire us in Oklahoma we had to prove our our uh, our worth our trust and a big thing of getting trust was um, showing people that you can do whatever they need to do and not saying pay me first and I'll and I'll do it later so this is this is just an extension of that this is just talking and getting people to know you um, and then when they have a situation, they're like, oh, I remember those guys. I enjoyed that conversation. And then next thing you know, you got a client. So yeah. really love what you guys are doing here. And it's been a pleasure. And thanks so much for inviting me. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. So we'll talk to everybody again soon. Yeah. Absolutely. Take care, everybody.